This is Hope and Health with Doctors Michelle and Mark Sherwood. Insights and interviews with a dose of straight talk to help you enjoy optimal health in all areas of life. Hi, everyone. So welcome back again, of course. And we're here with a brand new friend of mine today. Um, We're going to call him the healthy skeptic, a.k.a. Dr. Robert Davis. Robert, welcome to the show today. Hello, Mark. It's great to be with you. So, man, we were talking beforehand. You've written several books. You've been on many, many, many media stages. Um, Talk about your first three books. And then today we're going to focus on your newest book, which is called Supersized Lies. So go ahead. Well, you know, my background, Mark, is uh, I have a background as a journalist. I've spent many years as a health journalist reporting on all kinds of health-related issues. I also have an academic background in public health and epidemiology. So what I've tried to do in all of my work, both my reporting and the previous books I've written, is to look at the science, break down the claims, because there's so much, as we all know, confusing and conflicting information about health, particularly about diet, nutrition, fitness, Uh, particularly in those areas. And so what I try to do and what I've tried to do in in this book and the previous books is to look at what the science actually says to help readers understand what the science says so they can make more informed decisions. I don't see my job. I'm not a clinician. My job is not to advise patients or tell them what to do, but at least it's to give them more accurate information so they can make better decisions for themselves. So in my previous book called Fitter Faster, I looked at the science of exercise, broke down a lot of the information we hear about what's true and what's not true around fitness. Before that, a a book called Coffee is Good for You with a good crossed out and bad written in. The idea being that that coffee is just one example of many when it comes to conflicting claims about diet. So I looked at a number of different claims, everything from red meat to red wine, what's true and what's not about diet claims. And then the first book called The Healthy Skeptic, um, I sort of looked at a number of different issues and sort of looked at the story behind the stories. You know, we hear that something is true. Well, what's the real story behind that? How does the media, how do corporations, how do uh, interest groups, how does the government, how do all these various entities influence the information and sometimes skew the information we get. So so what I've tried to do in, in the most recent book, Supersize Lies, is the same thing, but with regard to weight loss. And so it's the same approach. It's, it's sort of helping people make more informed decisions and cut through all the hype and misinformation and skewed information that we often get. So you mean you're trying to cut through this thing called bias somewhere, right? Yes, indeed, because there's so much out there and so much that we don't even recognize. I appreciate your work, uh, Robert, because you are really trying to get people to think for themselves once again, instead of just taking information as the gospel. And I think the most powerful thing is our listeners know that we can do for ourselves is think for ourselves and make wise, informed decisions. That's why I really honor and appreciate your work very, very much. Now, you're known as the healthy skeptic. Where did that name come from? I just got to ask you. Well, it actually came from the name of my first book. So the health, first book was called The Healthy Skeptic, and it was a title that I, I, my publisher and I agreed on. And so it's sort of, and it's an approach that I took uh, with that book and decided that it would be good to run with that in my additional books and the videos that I do. So um, it's, it's, I think it's an apt description of the approach that I take. Now, I love the new title or the title of the newest book, Supersize Lies. And I can only think that the way you've got it packaged and we'll have all these books, including the new one in the show notes below where you can order those, of course, ladies and gentlemen. But the Supersize Lies, obviously, I'm thinking of Supersize Fries. We know that doesn't work. <laughs> so I love how you package the, the title. And when you see the book you know, right below here, you'll know what I'm talking about with that. So, you know, kind of talk about the inspiration behind that book, if you will. Well, you know, part of it is there's several things, actually. Part of it is the reporting that I do. You know, so often as a journalist, I get press releases from all kinds of entities, from food companies, from diet peddlers, from people that are pushing diet pills, everything else. And I see the exaggeration and the hype. And so it's part of it was driven by my work as a journalist, just seeing the information that comes to me with people trying to get me to report things without questioning them. So I, and then I know that often these things do end up as headlines and they end up on social media. So I know that, that I see firsthand the kind of 
uh, information peddling, as it were, that goes on here. I also know just friends and relatives that have struggled for many years with their weight and, and, and the trouble and, and the emotional harm that the traditional approaches have inflicted on them, you know, yo-yoing with their weight, going, you know, trying all kinds of different diets and, and, and getting failure after failure and then blaming themselves and the terrible, as I say, emotional harm that that causes. So, so all of these issues really um, resulted in my wanting to try to address this issue because, again, I, as you say, there's so much we can do if we have the right information but having the wrong information and trying the wrong approaches can actually cause harm. And I've seen this firsthand. We've all seen it firsthand. And so I just think with weight being such an issue that affects so many people, so many millions of people, so many people struggle with it. And yet we continue to have an obesity epidemic that gets yep. worse and worse. I just thought that it was, it was such an important issue to tackle. Robert, what, in your opinion and assessment from your experience in um, your investigative journalism, would you say is, the, is maybe the top two most egregious harms that come from this these um, weight loss myths, if you will, and mechanisms that make you know this so important to us. Yeah, well, there there are a number. I mean, one certainly is um, is, is 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 time waste, time and money wasted on things that don't work, um, and so people end up trying different diets. They try. Uh, supplements. They try even exercise. And we can talk about that exercise is very important for health, but it's not so great at helping people lose weight. And yet people look to that as a way to lose weight and that fails. And so what happens is that people uh, waste lots of time and money and en energy on things that don't work. And that actually may result in greater weight gain because, you know, they, they go on a very calorie restricted diet, they lose weight, but then their bodies respond in a way to make not only the weight they lost come back, but even more weight. So they see this yo-yo effect, and they, and, and that, in that sense, it, it makes the problem worse. They may take dietary supplements that have side effects that are harmful. And so in that sense, uh, doing the wrong things really can be harmful. Um, I, I, I think also that the, 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 di the diet culture that we're in contributes to the sense that if only you eat uh, less and move more, E-L-M-M -M it's sometimes called. And I like to say that for many people, Elm Street, E-L-M-M, -M, yeah is a dead end because yeah. we're told it's simply about that. And if you do that, that you should lose weight. And the corollary of that is if it doesn't work for you, then the problem is you, you're a failure. Yeah. You didn't try hard enough. Uh, you're lazy. Uh, you're not, you're, you're not diligent enough. And that's not true. But the problem mm -hmm. is that people internalize this message. And so when that uh, method doesn't work for them, they think there's something wrong with me. And it leads to depression. It leads it to all kinds of terrible emotional harms. And it makes it even harder for people to control their weight and to live a healthier life. So that's, I'd, I'd say, is another huge harm that comes from this message, this pervasive message that it's all about. It's simply about eat less, move more. Yeah, and I see a lot of people walk around in this concept of shame, too, when they're not successful at these things. And, of course, society will perpetuate that because skinny is successful, skinny is sexy the whole bit. And you're, you're in California, which, you know, is the, the nest egg of Hollywood. That's kind of what it's perpetuated with, right? So, you know, I, when I look at this issue, like you mentioned correctly, that obesity is really the fastest growing non-communicable disease in the world right now, really. Um, why, it seems like the answer is pretty simple. Why do you think there's so much misinformation or perhaps erroneous information going on out there regarding weight loss? Well, you know, one reason to put it very bluntly is money. Yeah. Um, you look at the weight loss industry, it's estimated to be over $60 billion annually in the U.S. And a number of players in that industry stand to profit from the proliferation of this myth, misinformation, whether it's people that are peddling you know, uh, uh, diets that will fad diets, whether it's people that are pushing specific, you know, weight friendly foods that will help you lose weight or, or have a healthy weight, uh, whether it's dietary supplement pushers, whether it's gyms that say join and lose 30 pounds and, you know, in a month, whatever it is, the list goes on. But a, a number of players um, benefit from the spread of this misinformation. Um, so so I, I think I think that's a big reason. Um, and 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 so I think that what, what I've tried to do, again, is to take on, to help people understand, you know, who is behind this information. Um, mm -hmm. I think another factor is the, the media. The media tend to 
sort of report without questioning a lot of the press releases and information that's handed to them. So I talk about in the book um, ways that we'll hear that some particular food, uh, whatever it is, eating avocados, eating chili peppers, drinking green tea, whatever it is, is, is going to help you lose weight. Now, a lot of these foods are perfectly healthy and they're parts of a healthful, weight-friendly diet, but these are not magical foods that are going to somehow melt away pounds. But because of the way that our system works, the manufacturers sponsor these studies. They put out press releases. The media say, oh, this is a great story. It'll get a lot of clicks and a lot of eyeballs. And so the headline you see is avocado helps you shed fat. Um, and so, so that's another factor. And then, of course, there's social media, which, which results in people being in echo chambers. So whatever their belief is, whether they believe the, the magical diet is a vegan diet or a gluten-free diet or a, a low-carb or low-fat, whatever it is, they end up having those ideas reinforced um, because of social media. And so I think that we, we can't discount that as well in, ter in terms of um, amplifying and perpetuating these ideas. You know, here, as we were talking before coming on um, today, uh, we were talking about this idea of body composition. Uh, I didn't tell you this, but we, we absolutely threw away the scale in our clinic because I got tired of people being controlled by a mechanism that did nothing but either bring um, inappropriate joy or inappropriate disappointment. You know, mm -hmm. this is not right. So I've had this one, this one day, Robert, where I, I got sick of it. Somebody came in and I greeted them. They greeted me and I was out the front for a change one day. And I, I, we had to scale. This was years ago. And I hear behind the same voice that says, Oh, I'm so depressed now. I looked around and sure enough, the person was standing on the scale. So I removed them from the scale and had the nurse put them on the body composition machine. We used in body at that time. And it turns out that they had actually gained lean body mass and lost body fat being a net loss of percent body fat. And so that day was the last day of the scale. I took it, went across the parking lot, threw it in the nice expensive scale in the dumpster <laughs> and hope nobody got it out of the dumpster. <laughs> it just hurt people. Uh, talk about your um, uh, concepts and how they relate to, you know, what I just said. Talk about body composition, how important that is. Well, that's very important. You know, and as you, exactly as you say, Mark, it's the, the scale can be a real problem because it doesn't take into account. It doesn't tell us the nuances we need to know. It doesn't tell us uh, if we've lost or gained weight. Was that muscle mass? Was it fat? What, what was it? And obviously what we're talking about here is losing fat. We're not talking. We don't want to lose muscle. And 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 yet some diets, including we've seen evidence from certain diets, for example, um, intermittent fasting, there's some evidence it may result in more muscle mass loss than other diets. So the point is that we can end up losing muscle mass and that's something we don't want to do. So I think that's, you're right. It's crucial that when we assess uh, not only how much our metabolic health and our, uh, and our body composition, that we have the right tools to do that. Unfortunately, for most people, it's not an easy thing to do. If they have access to something like your clinic and an expert like you, they can do that. But in many cases, it's hard because um, they have to find somebody. It's sometimes it's expensive. It's hard to access. And so what we're left with, sadly, is uh, either the scale, which is we agree is a very primitive way of understanding our body composition, or BMI, which is not which is the standard indicator that's used, and that just is based on height and weight, and it's a, a bad indicator as well. As we know, there are a number of studies I talk about this in the book that shows that BMI or body mass index is not a good predictor of metabolic health, and there are people that are show up as being you know obese on BMI scale that actually are metabolically healthy and not really and don't have too much body fat. And the converse is true: people that are normal on, on BMI that are told, "Well, you're fine," they're not fine. They're not metabolically healthy, and they actually there maybe they're skinny fat, as it were. And so th the tools that, that are typically used, and not just um, in everyday use, but by in studies and by government officials and all the rest, uh, the scale and BMI are woefully inadequate. And that's a big problem when it comes to really getting a handle on uh, the obesity epidemic. Folks, we're talking with Dr. Robert Davis about his brand new book, Supersize Lies, not to be confused with supersized fries, once again, <laughs> supersized lies. So Robert Davis is also known as the healthy skeptic, which was uh, and a moniker that he took on after the first book that he wrote, The Healthy Skeptic, by the same name. So um, we were talking about this, um, this thing earlier. You mentioned diets. I want to focus in on a popular diet today, and I'm going to get your take on it. 
uh, keto diet. Explain, perhaps from your point of view, what is proper keto and what is improper keto? Well, obviously, there are a lot of people that swear by it. There are a lot of people that have found that it works for them. And so, again, I, as I've said before, my job is not to tell people that you should or shouldn't be in a particular diet. And it's not to say because everybody's different, different diets are going to work for different people. But here's, what we, here's at least what I know from looking at the research. And, and, and I've done my best to look thoroughly at the research as objectively and lay it out as honestly as I can based on what we currently know. And that is that keto diets, at least the way that they're typically practiced for most people, can result in weight loss in the short term. We're talking up to six months or so, maybe a year. Um, but over time, they're hard to maintain. And yep. that people, because they are so restrictive, it's hard for people to maintain this diet over the long run. And they're relatively high dropout rates, even more so than for other diets in this particular diet. And so there's certain people that can stay on it, but there are other people that are many people that have a hard time. As regard as with regard to how to do it properly, I think that, um, th that I think many people end up loading up on a lot of fats, and there's controversy about the extent to which saturated fats are harmful. But there is evidence, at least, that they can raise your LDL, your bad cholesterol. Now, you, you also may have a lowering of triglycerides, so it's unclear exactly what the overall effect is on heart health. So there's some concern about that. There's also obviously concern: the more that you restrict, the less likely you're going to get all the nutrients you need, whether it's fiber, whether it's um, other vitamins and minerals. So I think that that's something that's very important if, as people are on that diet to make sure that they're uh, getting all the, all the nutrients they need and not losing out on things, including particularly fiber from whole grains or certain uh, lots of fruits and vegetables that they're going to need. So I think that, yes, it can be done properly. And I'm sure that you can, uh, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you do help your patients understand if they're going to do it, how to do it properly. But I think there are a lot of people who Think first about cosmetics when it comes to weight loss. Okay, I just want to you know lose these pounds and look better. And health is secondary, and that's the opposite of the way it should be. So I think first and foremost, it should always be about your current health and your long term health. And too often, whether it's keto or another diet, um, ends up I think potentially harming people's health or certainly not improving it. Folks, I promise this is not a broken record. This is not me feeding him what to say, because I know you've heard <laughs> me say this many times. Uh, this is a, this is definitely a catered spirit moment here. So intermittent fasting, Robert, does it work? Again, it works short term, and there, there are studies that show it does work. And it works as well as calorie-restricted diets. But it doesn't, again, the studies don't show that it works better than calorie-restricted diets. So again, for people that can go for many hours, and we know there are different variations on this diet, whether it's a 5-2 or whether it's every other day or whether it's time-restricted feeding when you only eat within a certain window, um, that it can work. And if, and if you can go for long stretches without eating or eating very little, that's fine. But we know that it doesn't work for a lot of people. And it, there's not necessarily evidence that it can work long term, uh, that people can sustain it. Also, as I mentioned earlier, there's some evidence that it may result in more muscle loss than calorie restricted diets. So we have to be careful, uh, careful about that as well. You know, there was one researcher that came out with a study whom I quote on time restricted feeding. And she said, it's so simple. All you have to do is watch the clock. Well, maybe for some people that's simple, but for, I know for me and other people, mm -hmm. that's the point. You end up watching the clock all day and you become obsessed with when am I going to eat? And that becomes very difficult. So food sort of takes over uh, your thinking, it pervades your thinking because you're not eating. So again, I think it's an individual thing, but overall it's not a magic bullet. It's not something that's going to somehow be the answer to everybody's prayers when it comes to weight. And so I think if people try it, they need to go in with eyes wide open. And if it doesn't work, not to blame themselves, that somehow they fail because their friend or somebody else mm -hmm. um, found success with that particular diet. I like how you put the idea of an inappropriate obsession because I've seen people before inappropriately and obsessively check their blood pressure, which over the course of time elevates their blood pressure. You know, mm -hmm. so I know you get asked this a lot and I know the answer, I believe, but I want them to hear it from you. Uh, you've written this brand new book called Super Size Lies once again, and we'll have that in the feed. I want you folks to get that too, by the way, order that at the link down below. Very important. But what is the best diet for losing weight? The best diet for losing weight or for, for and keeping it off. And again, that's the key. I mean, you can any, just about any diet can help you lose weight or kickstart your efforts in the short term. But the real challenge is what about the long term? You, because most of us sadly regain lost weight and sometimes more than we initially lost. And so the key is what's going to work in the long term. And so what works in the long term that research shows is what is also good for optimal health. And that is to say, 
a whole foods diet, largely plant diet. And what does that mean? It means um, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, nuts, beans, seeds, meats, lean meats, fish, um, dairy, if you eat dairy, uh, plenty of those foods and minimizing highly processed foods, things like chips, sweets, soda, French fries, those kinds of foods. Now that people are gonna say, well, if we knew that we hear that all the time. That's a healthy diet. But the point is that that's the kind of diet that is going to, as I say, not only optimize your health, but also help you over time maintain a healthy weight. The great thing about this way of eating is there's lots of flexibility. You can tailor it to what you like. You know, there, I don't like uh, cauliflower. I don't like avocados. There are plenty of foods I don't like. You don't have to eat foods you don't like. You can find plenty of foods within those large groups that you do like and that, that are going to satisfy you. And that's what's key. The harder part is there's not a list of foods you can eat and that you must never eat. So in that sense, you have to figure it out on your own. But that work will pay off because in the long run, you'll find a diet, you'll find a way of eating that works for you that you can sustain over the long term. And one other point I would make, Mark, is that these foods that you should minimize, these highly processed foods, it doesn't mean never touch them. These aren't poisonous foods. They're not toxic foods. It never means it doesn't mean never have a piece of cake. It doesn't mean never eat French fries. It just means try over time to reduce your intake of these foods so they become occasional treats rather than everyday staples. And that takes time. You can't, no one can do that overnight. You know, I used to eat that way with my, my diet was filled with soda and fries and hamburgers and French fries and all the rest. And so over time, over a number of years, I have changed the way I eat. So people need to be patient, make very small gradual changes so that over time they can increase more of their, of the uh, whole foods uh, in their diet and decrease the highly processed foods. And, and I think they need to be patient because that's key. You can't change the way you've spent many years eating overnight. I was talking to someone just the, this morning about, you know, changing this is kind of like uh, rather than a light switch off and on, it's a dimmer switch. It just gets a little bit brighter over time. I'm curious, um, you know, what was it in your own life, the epiphany, if you will, that said, I'm here and I don't need to be here anymore in regard to this uh, highly Con high consumption of processed foods and sodas. What, what was it that changed your life? You know, for me, it was when I was in college. I had grown up eating the way a lot of kids eat. I had, as I said, uh, all the junk food, everything from, you know, cupcakes to potato chips and, you know, uh, uh, Kool-Aid, all the rest, uh, those kinds of foods growing up. And that was high in sugar, high in fat, high in, you know, refined carbohydrates. And it was when I got, when I got to college and started learning about nutrition and you know, I thought, oh, I'm doing well because I'm drinking 2% milk. That's good. So, and what I when I started learning about nutrition in college, I said, well, maybe my diet's not so good. And the more that I learned and the more that I recognized the benefits of uh, eating a healthful diet, the more I started thinking about, okay, maybe I need to make some changes. Again, they were gradual, but you know, something else, Mark, is I've also changed what I eat as new information becomes available because science, uh, unlike religion, is not fixed in stone. And then as we get new information about what's healthy, um, it's that's appropriate. And because science is always trying to get us closer to the truth, you know, for years, I didn't eat much fat because I thought that we want to eat a very, very low fat diet. And newer science has shown that no, eating no fat is not necessarily a good thing. There are good fats and bad fats. And so I've incorporated, you know, uh, nuts and seeds and uh, oils and, uh, and fatty fish into my diet. And so have found that that has a beneficial effect when it comes um, to my metabolic profile. And so the point is that I've made changes as new information has become available and I continue to do that. And so I think people need to be open to going with new information, new science as it becomes available. But, um, but again, in my, in my, uh, life, it's been, uh, a gradual process and I would say an evolving process. So as we wrap up our time here, I want to make sure that we tell people how to connect with you. We're going to do that. So again, we're talking about Dr. Davis, the healthy skeptic, his most recent book, Supersize Lies. And we'll put the links to connect with you and the links to get the books and all your books in the show notes. But here we are in this time we call the pandemic, post-pandemic, however we view it. People have put on a lot of weight. Uh, some have called it the quarantine 19, the COVID-15, however we do that. What advice would you give somebody right now that says, hey, Dr. Davis, man, I'm struggling with this. Where do I start? I would start with two things. I would start with focusing on um, greater awareness of the foods you're putting in your body. So that is to say to try to, we, we talked about this, minimizing the highly refined foods. 
uh, and, to, and to eat more uh, whole foods, that foods are going to satisfy you and fill you up. So that's number one. And number, t- number two, to move your body. We didn't talk much about this. While exercise is not necessarily great at helping you lose weight, it's very important to prevent further weight gain. And there are m- so many other important benefits of exercise, everything from improving your mood to decreasing the risk of heart disease and cancer it can also help you feel more empowered. So you'll make better food decisions as well. And so I think that, it, that, that moving your body in whatever way, you don't have to go to the gym if that's not your thing. It doesn't mean you have to run marathons. It just means moving your body on a regular basis in a way that, uh, that works for you. I think that's something else um, that's so important when it comes to getting a handle uh, on your weight and, getting, and, and improving your health. I appreciate you saying that about exercise because one thing is we've preached in here until I'm blue in the face is don't use exercise to lose weight. Uh, obviously, it doesn't work. It creates a, a whole a cascade of hormonal imbalances over time, which causes actually sometimes weight gain. Um, maybe we can get this um, a replay on this at some point, a redo and talk about exercise. I would like that because we could do a whole show on that one because that's a whole area that most people don't talk about. They just don't go there. Right. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Let's, let's do that sometime. Would, would you do that? I would love that. Thank you. That'd be fun. Um, Robert, how can people connect with you? Um, they can go to my website, healthyskeptic.com, and there they can get uh, links to the books I've written. Also, they'll find a number of videos, uh, lots of videos I've done on some of the topics and many other topics, um, many of the topics we've talked about today, short videos, sort of just looking at what is it, what's the claim and then what does the science really say? So I invite people, if they're interested, to go check out those videos as well. So, folks, I want you to connect with the Healthy Skeptic. You can also, uh, we'll also put the links to his Facebook and his Instagram uh, feeds as well. You can connect right there. Is that, those are still good to connect with? Yes. Sure. Sure. Um, go to his website and make sure you avail yourself to not just the supersized lies, but also his three other books as well. When you fill your mind with good information, with good information that's giving you sides of the coin from every side of the coin, you're going to make, generally speaking, better decisions. And we really want you to make better decisions. Um, Robert, I thank you, man, for um, for joining us today. It's been a real treat and a pleasure. Um, how about you give some uh, final concluding words of wisdom from your expertise to our audience? I would just say, Mark, that uh, the bottom line is, weight loss is hard. Don't get discouraged. Don't let anyone tell you it's impossible. Don't let anyone tell you you can't do it. Don't let anyone tell you just throw up your hands because um, yes, it's hard. And yes, um, there's a lot of confusing information. But if, as you say, if you get the right information, you can make a difference in your life. You can get to a healthy weight, a weight that's right for you. And, and most important, you can live uh, a, a life that's full of well-being and a life of that, that, that allows you to do what you want to do and live your life the way you want. But it's all about getting the right information and acting on that information. You, sir, are a blessing to people around the world. I appreciate you doing this. So thank you so much. And uh, thanks for coming on today, too, uh, Robert. Um, again, folks, that's Dr. Robert Davis, a.k.a. The Healthy Skeptic. Uh, and that is a good example of a person who took information from an investigative journalist side and found out what was true, what was not true, what was half truth and unwound the confusing um, yarn and ball of confusion today and gave you truth. So I appreciate you again for coming on. Look forward to doing this again. Thank you, Mark. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, we'll see you next time on Hope and Health. Doctors Mark and Michelle Sherwood and their clinic can help you find the Hope and Health you were created to enjoy. Go to Sherwood.tv for clear, proven ways you can be healthier. Subscribe at Sherwood.tv.